What is money? If you go back far enough in time, you will encounter the barter economy. This is where Arthur, who has an apple, meets Ben, who has a banana. Arthur would like Ben's banana, and Ben would like Arthur's apple, so they agree to trade. This works well if Arthur has what Ben wants at the same time that Ben has what Arthur wants. But if Arthur only wants half a banana and Ben only wants half an apple, then they must both be split into two. Half an apple can then be traded for half a banana. However, Arthur is now left with half an apple and Ben is left with half a banana. Both of these will rapidly go off. So the barter economy works but it depends on you having what I want at exactly the same time that I have what you want. This is not practical for a fully functioning economy, so we're going to need some form of currency, some form of means of exchange, that will allow Arthur to buy bananas whenever he wants and Ben to buy apples whenever he wants. We're going to consider using tomatoes as a currency, as a means of exchange for goods and services in our economy. Now, if you're thinking that tomatoes would not make a good currency, then you would be right. And the reason that they would not make a good currency is that they do not fulfil the four criteria that we look for in an ideal currency. First of all, tomatoes can be created and they can be destroyed. So if you want more money, for example, you could just grow your own pay rise. Secondly, tomatoes are not homogeneous and are not divisible. You can have large tomatoes, small tomatoes, ripe tomatoes, etc. And also, if you want to buy something that costs half a tomato, then you're left with the other half, which will make your trousers soggy when you put it in your pocket. Thirdly, tomatoes do not act as a store of wealth. If you're saving up to pay for your next holiday with tomatoes, by the time it comes to paying for your holiday, you will no longer have nice ripe tomatoes with which to pay, but a nasty soggy mess, which will not be accepted by the travel company. And finally, tomatoes are useful for lots of other things. You may like to have tomatoes in your salad, or use them for baked beans and tomato ketchup. So if tomatoes do not make a very effective currency, then the question is, what does? The answer is gold. Gold cannot be created and it cannot be destroyed, despite what you might have read in The Alchemist. Gold is homogeneous and is divisible. You can hold gold bars, gold coins and gold dust. Gold acts as a store of wealth. That gold bar that you own will be exact the same in one year's time, ten years' time, and in a thousand years' time. And finally, gold has no industrial application. Now, I know that you can find gold in some electronic items, but the point here is that the price of gold is not affected by industrial demand, unlike silver, whose price is much more volatile. And so we can start to use gold to trade as a means of exchange in our economy. If I want to buy a small item, I can use gold dust, while for larger items, I can use gold bars. But gold is not very practical. If I'm paying for a coffee with gold dust, I depend on the coffee shop having very accurate scales. And if there's a gust of wind at the wrong moment, then my gold dust will be blown away. Meanwhile, if I'm carrying gold bars around in my pockets, then my trousers are likely to fall down due to the weight. So I need somewhere to store my gold until I need it. And so Arthur takes his gold bars and stores them in the bank. The bank issues Arthur with an IOU, in effect a credit note saying that Arthur owns the gold. So if Arthur wants to buy a second-hand car from Ben, he exchanges his note with the bank for the gold bars that the bank was looking after for him. He then trades the gold bars for the car, which is now sold to him. But what does Ben do with the gold bars? He deposits them with the bank, of course, who issue him with a credit note or IOU as proof of ownership of the gold. Now, this is a very long-winded process for Arthur to end up with the car and to Ben to end up with the IOU note. Would it not have been much easier for Arthur to have exchanged the IOU note with Ben for the car and for the gold to have remained at the bank? And here we see the birth of paper currency. In effect, a credit note or IOU backed by gold. For every gold bar that the bank holds, it can issue a credit note which can then be traded in the economy as legal tender. As this is fine for the economy, 
Arthur and Ben get used to using paper currencies backed by gold as a means of exchange for goods and services. But what if we try an experiment? What if we take one of the gold bars away? Now we have two credit notes circulating in our economy, but they're only backed by one bar of gold. What effect does this have on our economy? The answer is none, because no one has checked to see how much gold is actually backing the currency. We've now moved to the point where everybody in the economy has faith in the paper currency. And this allowed President Nixon to perform the ultimate experiment in 1971 when he delinked from the gold standard, effectively creating a world in which trade is conducted by paper currencies that are backed by nothing. These are known as fiat currencies, from the Latin, let it be done. And that is the world in which we live today. Transactions are conducted in currencies that are, in effect, worthless. The paper we use to trade goods and services only has a value because we believe it has a value. If you lose faith in the paper currency, then it is in effect worthless. We operate in an economy based purely on faith. And that is what money really is.